Thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about force multipliers and uh, why should one try to be one. And this is uh, a big reason why I do what I do. I am deeply bought into the ideology that you can really amplify the impact of some people who are trying to do things that resonate strongly with you, uh, you that you think are important cause areas to be working towards. And being a force multiplier, to me personally, is a very motivating aspect of my job. So I'm going to try and explain to you what I mean by force multiplication, how can you be an effective force multiplier, etc. cetera. Uh, the concept of force, force multiplication comes from military science. So uh, the definition is it refers to a factor or a combination of factors that dramatically increase the effectiveness of a group or of a given number of troops and um, or the weapons that they're using to accomplish things that they actually would not have been able to accomplish without this amplification, without this intervention. Uh, so I think while the term comes from a military uh, science and back backdrop, but the general principle is applicable to pretty much anything. Uh, wherever there's a scope to achieve something collectively with coordinated effort, uh, wherever a group of people is trying to achieve something uh, that, that is useful, that, that they think is important to be done, that a case can be made for optimizing that uh, initiative and an effort in a way that it leads to amplified impact, it leads to better, more efficient functioning of whatever you're trying to push towards. So I think to drive the clarity of concept, it's important to maybe look at this thing with respect to if you're trying to uh, amplify the impact, increase the impact, or the influence of a group or a collection of people, or of a single individual uh, or a thought leader. And I think uh, while doing one does not necessarily mean that you're not going to be using the same practices and principles not going to be effective at the other, but I think it's important to try and draw out the different types of personalities, I also almost want to say, that can be effective at doing these two things, uh, either amplifying the impact of a group or amplifying the impact of an individual. And then I think the question that one needs to ask themselves is that how do you, with your um, you know, boundedly rational, self, limited abilities, capabilities, time and resources, uh, drive that intervention, drive uh, effective interventions that amplify the impact of the group or the individual that you're trying to support or enable. So uh, here I want to clarify the value chain of an organization, because I think uh, in order to figure out where can you, amplify, uh, can you amplify impact, it's important to understand what is core to the promise that you bring to whoever you're trying to reach out to, uh, whether a, with a product or a service or a, a piece of information that you want to put out there. And then how, do you, how does your organization enable that core promise to be fulfilled or to be delivered? So I think there's core value functions and there's support value functions, but I'm going to try and take some examples and clarify uh, uh, this distinction. Anything that is the actual promise of your organization to uh, whoever it's uh, addressing or trying to reach out to is what I'd like to call uh, on the core value chain of your organization. Uh, so if you're a financial technology company or you, know, uh, you have a product that's uh, finance related, personal finance related or corporate finance related, the actual product development, what that product is, what, it, what, what are the services and the perks that come bundled with it, uh, and the sale of that product, getting that to the final end customer and the people who are responsible for making that sale, driving that P&L. Those are the two sort of core value functions of the organization. And then these functions are supported by a whole host of um, other important uh, functions that enable these core value functions to actually uh, accomplish what they're trying to accomplish. So there's the, depending on the size and the scale of your organization, your requirements, there's legal, there's marketing, there's things that feed into the product development, there's things that impact the sales, like the, uh, the, the channels you use for marketing, etc. There's uh, human resource management, there's financial management, bits of your work could be outsourced to partners, so you could be working with a network of stakeholders who are collectively uh, trying to do something, uh, uh, managing that project. So all these support functions are invariably consistent across organizations. These skills are also extremely fungible. They do uh, come with overtones of specialization that you develop once you're working in a field, but uh, a lot of this is uh, general experience that's very transferable 
across organizations, especially organizations that are working in a specific field, the way all the effective altruism organizations, they, they have a methodology, they have a, a specific agenda they are trying to accomplish, and very similar metho uh, methods of accomplishing, of getting there, basically. Uh, to take a different example, in a manufacturing setup, the shop floor, the factory where the manufacturing happens, the supply chain that gets the product from shop floor to the end customer, as well as the, again, the function that makes the sales, that handles the targets month on month, uh, quarter on quarter, these are the core value functions. And then in a research organization, your research is your core value output that you put out there in the world, and everything that supports it is the enabling function. And I think it's important to look at an organization not just as, uh, as valuable, as important, or as iconic as its core value functions, but also uh, as a bundle of uh, these functions that stand on top of solid foundations of these support or enabling functions that run the show, that make things happen. OK, so um, I want to talk a little bit about what you need to be effective. And I, this is not a laundry list or an exhaustive list of what I think can be uh, useful orientations to have or a useful environment to have to be effective in like a force multiplier role of sorts where you can uh, give yourself to this task and come out feeling that you've achieved something meaningful. Um, so if you're trying to do this with it for an organization or a collection of individuals, you need to, I think, have the systems mindset. You need to uh, uh, believe in the fact that developing scalable, robust, efficient systems lead uh, create um, create sort of systemic efficiencies leading leading to a lot of mental bandwidth freed up, a lot of um, interesting work opportunities for everyone. Uh, people don't necessarily need to be caught up doing uh, like a job which doesn't excite them, it's repetitive, it's, it, they're caught up in a rut. That doesn't need to happen if you build very scalable, uh, robust systems and uh, try and automate the tasks which are not cognitively uh, very stimulating for anyone. Uh, having said that, at times your predicament is such that you're nested within, uh, uh, like for FHI, we're nested within Oxford University, so we're, uh, we use their systems and processes and we have to tie in whatever we develop to those pre-existing systems. At times you might be dealing with uh, policy offices, a uh, lot of government interaction, and they have a certain way, a methodology, uh, uh, unsaid norms that you have to follow. So you could be you could be dealing within a microcosm or a macrocosm, which is which could be restricted, restrictive, or you could have all the bandwidth in the elbow room to do whatever you think is most efficient. But basically, having a mindset that uh, anything that's not cognitively interesting should be somewhat automated, somewhat sort of made free of any one free of any free of the dependence on any one individual. Uh, you need to have the mindset of problem solving. You're going to be bombarded with a bunch of uh, problems that are new, that you haven't anticipated before, uh, challenges that come because the environment in which you operate changes, uh, the, policy that you're, the policy guidelines that impact your organization and your output change. So within this very dynamic landscape, you need to be um, prepared for failure. You need to be able to anticipate future problems and attack them. That's not to say that you're always going to be prepared for anything that might be thrown your way. You're, you're definitely going to get uh, caught off guard many number of times. But it's just that mindset of um, knowing that, yes, things are going to break. It's going to be challenging. I haven't thought through this, but I'm ready to probably respond to this. We're agile enough as an organization, having our systems in place, but still uh, having the ability to, with agility, respond to problems that you haven't sort of anticipated before. Uh, then I think when you're trying to develop, uh, when you're trying to be a force multiplier for a group of people, an organization, there needs to be a buy-in from the organization. So between a team that's providing an enablement service and, and, and the team that's trying to achieve the core objective within an organization, there needs to be an implicit understanding of what is the service level agreement that you're uh, willing to sign on for. So how much work will the operations team totally commit to doing? How much mind space are they committing to sort of free up for other people? How much are they going to share the load in terms of doing some bits and meeting the ops team midway? So every organization, because of the environment in which it operates in, the legacy systems it has, uh, the place it wants to get to, uh, has like an implicit tacit understanding of how all this will be handled. So getting uh, buy-in there, having the authority to uh, implement that and reinforce uh, uptake of these 
processes that you set in place. I think that's that's an important thing to focus on and uh, drive clarity on when you're working in a setup like this. And then, of course, all of this happens with teamwork. Whenever you're trying to support a collective, a, a group of individuals, uh, if it's 12 to 15 people, then like a couple of people can do an effective job at taking care of all of their needs. Uh, it's a very, it'll be a very challenging situation, a huge learning opportunity for those two people, but they'll be able to sort of uh, provide the services, uh, the enablement that's needed. But when your organization scales up to 50, 100, 150, uh, plus 500 becomes like a different game altogether. So developing solutions that scale up, that don't, uh, that break with grace, that don't sort of crumble under pressure of scale up and change. Uh, those are sort of important things that you need to keep focusing on, and I think that'll make one an effective force multiplier for a group. What do you do for an individual? Um, so I think the ability to model someone's preferences effectively, uh, to see what do they need, what are the bits of information that they are usually looking for when they're trying to assess whether to commit to a situation or not, um, what are the kinds of questions that they're invariably going to ask you, uh, what is the information that you need to pre-collect or assess, uh, how do you best distill that information. All these things um, help you develop a model of the person that you're working with, uh, working for, whose impact you're trying to amplify. You get feedback on the model in the sense you see whether your uh, predictions are accurate, inaccurate, how can you refine them, fine tune them a little more. Um, so I think that's that's where you start. And it's interesting because I was, I, I was talking to Nick about my presentation and he said, well, there's a level zero which is basic support and general competence, and how he said that was not making a mess of things. So not coming up and mucking everything up is also used extremely important. So it starts there, and then you develop a bit of a rapo, you develop a model for the preferences of the person you're trying to work with, um, and you feed that information back to them. I think that's where the importance of preference modeling lies, that you give them the um, confidence that you're doing a decent job at accurately representing their uh, beliefs accurately representing their re requests and requirements so that they start delegating more things to you and, um, and getting that authority, taking that cognitive load off of their plate, uh, giving them more time to engage in things that um, ostensibly they should be doing, that they're much better at doing. I think that's where a real value is uncovered in when you're trying to support an effective altruist leader of sorts or, or a leader who, or a thought leader who, you know, you. Uh, really want to amplify the impact of. I think at the third level, you start developing complementary skills or things that are needed. So if you're supporting someone who's writing a book, uh, you would be able to add a lot of value by understanding what, what are the best ways of digitally marketing a product in today's world. You don't necessarily have to build all the skills yourself, but you need to have enough uh, subject matter knowledge in order to work with experts, in order to collaborate with um, people you hire on retainers or people you hire for, for a one-time project to do any of these things. If, if the person that you're uh, aligned to is not a great networker but could benefit a lot from uh, meeting certain individuals, uh, being part of some conversations, then how do you, in your capacity, enable and facilitate those meetings, those connections? Um, if you're not good at it, how, how do you leverage the network around you in order to achieve that end outcome, uh, I think becomes like the level three of operating while being the uh, force multiplier for an individual. And then I think there is there are some things that get unlocked. There are levels that get unlocked only after long-term association, uh, after a lot of trust has been built, after a lot of uh, challenges, situations have been uh, conquered, observed uh, together, if uh, the, the problems that you face together. And then after that, not only the person you're aligned to and yourself, but other people start seeing you as a credible proxy who can stand in for that person's uh, judgment, for that person's uh, viewpoint uh, on something. And I think that's where you truly free up a lot of mind space, a lot of uh, long-term uh, impact opportunities are sort of unlocked when you reach that stage. I'm a little conscious that I'm running, I'm rambling on and running out of time, so I'm gonna try and rush through the uh, last three slides a little bit. I'm I want to call a uh, focus on some critical, I think, I want to call them traits, critical features that a person who's trying to do this, who's trying to be an effective force multiplier, I think if they have these things, they'll be, um, they, they're more, they're poised for more success than I would think that if, if, you know, some of these things are lacking. And again, this is not exhaustive, 80,000 hours, their ops post has a whole section on the mindset, the skills, 
that uh, you want to be uh, culling out for, focused on uh, honing, et cetera. So I think I'd recommend everyone read that. But I think value alignment or mission focus to me uh, is something that's extremely important uh, for an operations person or for a person who's trying to amplify the impact of an ideology in the world. Uh, there, this is not to say that value-aligned people uh, have it easy. They, they're just, it's all fun and games and excitement. Uh, your job can get really hard at times, and it can get really challenging. But if you're value-aligned, you're deeply bought into the mindset, the ideology, then the challenges and the failures and the setbacks won't, uh, won't lead you to question your life choices, in the sense they'll, they'll still hurt, and they'll feel bad, and y you'll be driven to improve. Uh, all the good things will come out of it, but you will not feel uh, that, should I be doing this? Should I be doing something else? So I think that whole element goes away, and it leads to lasting satisfaction. So I cannot stress the importance of this more. Um, the drive to upskill and learn. Um, and there needs to be some people in the organization or any movement, a community, that are ready to chew on glass. Like, and I don't know how to more delicately put this, but there are things that not everyone wants to do. Uh, but some people need to be uh, committed to doing those things in order to make sure that important things happen. The movement gets the wind it needs beneath its wings uh, because there are people who are doing the not so glamorous but super important things. I thought a bit about how to position this vicarious orientation that I want to point out to. Uh, but uh, I think so for a community that cares about aligned artificial general intelligence, uh, not everyone can be an AI safety researcher. It's not even effective if everyone is an AI safety researcher. So there need to be people who know that, OK, my strength is um, networking, or my strength is project management, or my strength is uh, putting together great events like this where people can come together and actually talk. Um, so playing to your strengths, identifying where you can contribute, where you can have the maximal uh, impact, and Committing to do that while, um, while knowing that you're freeing up time, mind space, energy of people who are really good at solving the kinds of problems that you're worried about. I think that that sort of an orientation helps uh, when you're trying, looking at things like that is useful when you're trying to be a force multiplier. And then whether you're a team player or you're an individual contributor, however you see your strengths, I think there's a place for you uh, if you're trying to support a team uh, of 50, 60, 100, whatever, multiple people, tens of people. You're part of a tightly knit unit that's committed to providing a certain level of service across all the processes that people have to engage in. So uh, your, your responsibilities are divided among three, four people of a team. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a team effort which uh, they, they fail together, they succeed together. So I think if you're a bit of a team player, which is a very useful, important uh, orientation to have when you're trying to support an organization, trying to be a force multiplier, trying to commit to a cause, trying to commit to doing things that are sort of non-glamorous, uh, then there's a place for you there. If you're an individual contributor, you sort of thrive a little more if you're given a more elbow room to flourish uh, and explore things, which is not to say that you don't have to have the uh, skill, the, you know, the ability to manage relationships and communicate effectively with a lot of people. Those are sort of hygiene skills that everyone needs. But if you need a bit more elbow room to flourish, then trying to explore opportunities for being a project manager, a personal assistant, an executive assistant to some high impact individuals is, I think, something that you would find very interesting. Lastly, I'd want to talk a little bit about what you gain from this experience. So I think the first, like, like the biggest thing you'll gain by supporting an organization, trying to amplify their impact, is how to run an organization. Like, how to run complex projects with multiple stakeholders, how to firefight things that you haven't anticipated, that you're not prepared to deal with. And that's a very useful skill in movement building, organization building, trying to accomplish something uh, where a lot of people with different levels of buy-in, different levels of uh, commitment uh, to different things that are important to the cause come together. So navigating those complex waters is a very important skill that you get to hone and develop a, a whole deal. You develop a great understanding of the layout of the, the, the lay of the land that you're dealing with. You get connected to all the important people. These are small communities, uh, few people coming together to do all sorts of uh, interesting and important things. They send, uh, they send leads, 
whether it's media engagement leads or leads of other policymakers along each other's way. So you get to interact with everyone who's important in the community, build your network, see how you can facilitate these interactions uh, given your strengths and your uh, understanding of the field. And then you get to develop your career capital by focusing, if you're interested, either in specialist skills, uh, figuring out how best to give grants, how best to host, uh, put up uh, com you know, events of this scale and nature, uh, or focusing, double-clicking on marketing, whatever interests you. Or you can keep developing these broad generalist skills of people who are effective at running uh, organizations, complex movements, helping uh, facilitate communication and growth of the whole community. Analogously, when you're talking about doing this for an individual, uh, you get to model an effective altruist leader, and you get to be their sidekick. And if the word sidekick is slightly offensive to you, then substitute it with whatever you're excited by. But what I mean to say is that without having the actual responsibility on your head, you're living the life of someone who has all these amazing opportunities knocking at their doors all the time. The kind of things that you get exposed to are people wanting advice on what to do with their company, what to do with their funds and resources that they've unlocked. Um, uh, you, you, a lot of policymakers, government people, NGOs knock on your door trying to understand how would you react to a particular recent development in the field. Uh, these are exciting times and these effective altruism is full of people who are extremely uh, sort of well-reasoned, thought-through thinkers who a lot of people want to listen to and get advice from. So there's a lot of opportunity to do uh, very interesting stuff and you're only limited by your own bandwidth, your own mental uh, your capacity to commit to different types of projects and deep dive into them. So obviously you get to pick what you like. You get to identify niches for yourself where you're like, maybe I want to develop this skill more, maybe I already am good at it and I, you know, I can really make a difference to this project. So you get to pick the projects that you like. Some people, uh, Laura is an example, is doing amazing work with Will McCaskill. She's Will's project manager and he gets a lot of requests for uh, well, where should I invest my money, or what to do, where, where to distribute this, this much, uh, these funds that we have in order to promote this sort of thinking in academia, build, uh, build the systems mindset that we're thinking about for these cause areas. So I think those are extremely interesting opportunities where she has to learn, she has to upskill, she has to talk to a lot of people, put herself in a, out of her comfort zone quite periodically, and you know, upskill in order to understand what's the best advice to feed, it, feed to Will, who has Limited time, limited energy. So, and then, yeah, I think I've spoken a bit about this. You aid decision making. Um, you can develop credible models for effective communication between these leaders, between the people who they are trying to, uh, the people that they are trying to reach, and the people who are trying to reach them. Uh, and you can truly, I think, have a, a huge impact in how you facilitate this whole process. So, I think it's important. This, this message that I'm leaving there, being good rather than seeming, so I'm not trying to say that, uh, yeah, whatever, like, <laughs> take this with a, uh, take this in the spirit that it's intended. Uh, highly impactful people or organizations always have a whole host of force multipliers behind the scenes. Any CEO has, like, a group of people who make magic happen, whether from writing amazing speech to coordinating their travel and logistics very efficiently, to figuring out how, how should they spend their time, how should they bunch up their preferences, uh, all of these things. So in areas of maximal contribution and impact that you can identify are, uh, Kyle Scott has a list that he shared in the operations forum of people who do not have either executive assistants or research assistants or project managers and who arguably should. They absolutely should. So there are many people in the community who uh, who, if you can support, it will be a hugely impactful thing to be doing. All the operations roles that are open and that tend to stay open for a really long time till the time that some academic commits to doing them till the time that we can find an ops person, all those roles are extremely important. They need people who want to be doing these things and are excited about doing these things to be doing them. So there are lots of opportunities if you want to try out, if you want to contribute. And then last, like it's not, it's not easy to do these things that uh, should magically happen. It's also not non-rewarding. At times, at times I've said things like this, or at times I've heard, like uh, in the heat of the moment, you feel that, oh well, is this rewarding? Should I be doing everything that you know other people arguably don't want to do, else they would have done it themselves? I think it's <laughs> it, it can be super rewarding as a net feeling because you're every day you're responsible for things. So if you if you're the kind of person who likes uh, knowing that 
me being uh, me being involved in the situation is actually leading to some positive impact, positive change. Well, you will be in a lot of situations where you're the last person responsible for the, those things. So it makes you responsible. It's hard because you're emotionally invested in what you're trying to do. You care deeply about the outcomes and the objectives that you're trying to achieve. And it's extremely challenging because you know the opportunity cost of failures. You know uh, the trade-offs that you're trying to make and the research time that you lose or uh, the energy, effort, resources that you lose if you muck things up. So, But being all this, it's also extremely awesome because you're in the eye of the storm. You're in the vortex where everything is happening and hopefully, yeah, hopefully happening well. <laughs> so I think there are preference biases that everyone has for being on the forefront, being the icon, and I think this field has uh, a little more of that. Like I've observed a lot of this uh, orientation where everyone wants to be uh, an icon in the field uh, rather than being OK with being the sidekick. So I think the movement can be turbocharged. It can be supercharged if there are people who understand that the forefront or what you cons consider maximally impactful is a bit of an illusion. It's, it's a, a, the benefit of hindsight lends you that uh, knowledge that, OK, this was actually the most impactful thing. So, be good, do good, find the people who are doing the kind of things that you think should be done, and try and contribute to it the best that you can. Thank you.